Today we're going to be looking at Psalm 78, if you brought your Bible. Uh, it's a really large psalm, so uh, I tried to pick some meaty portions of it, uh, but we couldn't do the whole thing. So I would encourage you to read it at home. It is just full of wisdom. Uh, we're not going to talk about it today, but it talks about passing on to the next generation what God has done, and I think that's very valuable. I recently read uh, this story about this heiress, and she had millions of dollars coming to her. Uh, but her father had stipulated in his will that she had to maintain a job, something she had never done, for an entire year before he, she would be entitled to the millions after his death. And it's an incredible story. This is true. You know, I kind of watched a video that went along with this article. Uh, they interviewed her. They found her in a mobile home. She couldn't make ends meet. She couldn't pay her bills. But she had millions in the bank just waiting with her name on it. And she gave this journalist every excuse in the book why she could not maintain a job. Any job. It could have been McDonald's for one year. And so she was just going to have to live like this. And I think that often reminds me, when we look at the Bible, of God's people. We often have an inheritance with our name written on it, but we just don't want to live that way. So we completely leave the millions in the bank. And that's where we come today as we look at this psalm. We're going to start in verse 21. Uh, the children of Israel were grumbling and complaining because, well, God saved them and took them out of Egypt and things, you know, were hot and they didn't like it. They didn't like uh, the way that they were going. They thought about going back into slavery. And so we, we come here at verse 21. It says, therefore, the Lord heard this and was furious. So a fire was kindled against Jacob. And anger also came up against Israel because they did not believe in God and did not trust in his salvation. Yet he had commanded the clouds above and opened the doors of heaven and rained down manna on them to eat and given them the bread of heaven. Men ate angels' food. He sent them food to the full. We're gonna skip to verse 32. In spite of this, they still sinned. And they did not believe in his wondrous works. Therefore, their days he consumed in futility, and their years in fear. When he slew them, they sought him, and they returned and sought earnestly for God. Then they remembered that God was their rock, and the most high God their redeemer. Nevertheless, they flattered him with their mouth, and they lied to him with their tongues, for their heart was not steadfast in him nor were they faithful to his covenant. But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and did not destroy them. Yes, many a time he turned his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. For he remembered but they, that they were but flesh, a breath that passes away and does not come again. How often they provoked him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. And we come to what I think is the central verse, verse 41. Yes, again and again, they tempted God and they limited the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember his power the day that he redeemed them from the enemy. So here's where we find God's special possession, Israel. We find them grumbling and complaining and getting the wrath of God. There are many reasons for the state that they were in, but I think the worst charge that the psalmist brings against them is this. They were limiting the Holy One of Israel. Some versions use that word limiting and they say provoked. It means the exact same thing. It's talking about an unbelief. It's talking about in our minds limiting the possibilities of an impossible God. These people were not living as God intended. Because of their unbelief, they chose misery instead of promised blessings. Psalm 81:11 said, but my people did not listen to my voice. Israel did not obey me. This is God. This is their Lord. He had proven himself time and time again miraculously to them. They should have chosen his ways over the ways of the world. And we wonder, what's wrong with these people? How do they keep getting themselves into the same situations? But we are the same. 
We are afraid to stand for righteousness from time to time. We're insecure in God and who he has called us to be. Then we begin to reflect the values of the world and we stop reflecting the values of God. If the Israelites had followed God's ways, God had promised them blessing and he would have blessed them richly, but they followed their own desires and they were left with next to nothing. We as Christian people, we are the children of God. We are those who get this inheritance of blessing. And sometimes, like Israel, we find ourselves limiting God. We are meant to exalt his praises. This is how he made us to be. We have to ask ourselves this question. Are we pursuing a life of praise? And how do you know if you are pursuing a life of praise? Well, ask yourself, am I enjoying the blessings of the Christian walk? Am I enjoying everything that God has promised me so freely? What is the state of my spiritual experience at this very moment? And even more, what is the state of the Christian church across the world? How is the church standing out? How are we known? Are we showing his great presence? Or are we showing the world that we are a group of people who are weak and therefore serve a weak God? It's possible for us to limit God and for him to say, oh, that they had listened. We see this with Jesus as he was looking out over Jerusalem. This is before his death and he called out Jerusalem, Jerusalem. If only they had listened to him. We see this constantly in scriptures. We can't turn God away from us. Isn't that good news? Even though we're sinners. But we can rob ourselves of a life of blessing. We enter this state of limiting God all of us are responsible to examine our lives to be sure that we are not limiting the Holy One. We're actually responsible for the state of Christianity as a whole. You may say the church is, is crazy, but not me. No, we are all of us, brothers and sisters, we are all of us responsible for how it is that the world sees our God. Are we limiting the Holy One of Israel? Here's how we should examine ourselves. First, to what extent Am I living in the blessings of Christ? And the second thing is, how am I walking in the power and the presence of the Lord? He desires to be with us. When we read in the New Testament, we are reading what is possible for the Christian believer. It wasn't just written as this amazing time, something that happened back then. It was written as a standard so that believers could read it and see how it is that we are to conduct our lives, what it is that is possible for us. Don't conform to the pattern of this world. Be transformed. We need to be reading God's word to be reminded of what it is God has called us to. Are we living up to the standard or are we li limiting God? So let's look at five ways that we can avoid limiting God. And the very first is that we would trust his saving power. Trust his saving power. We have to know that our sins are forgiven. We have peace with God. When we were in, in preschool, some of us that were raised in the church, and the, the teacher would say, do you wanna accept Jesus? Every single Sunday, my hand was up. All my friends, their hands were up. We were accepting Jesus every single Sunday. But as we become adults, we have to begin to walk sure in our salvation that he who promised is faithful. We don't have to keep saying, oh, I messed up, Lord, would you come into my heart? Clearly, I didn't have you before. Now I want you to be in my heart this time. He's greater than that. Scripture tells us if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. Do we believe that? If we don't, we're limiting him. We limit his love for us, his ability to save. 
Romans 5.1 says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 8.16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. We are children of God. He has given us a spirit of adoption, not a spirit of fear. We are able to call out, Abba, Father. And he is with us. He is mighty to save. This isn't for a special few. This isn't for special saints. We are all saints. We all have to call on the name of Jesus. We can't go on hoping and praying that, Lord, I followed the right steps, I did the right pattern of things, and I am right with you. We can't continue our lives never knowing if God really accepts us. This is how the children of Israel were living. They didn't know how they were with God. They just kept their head down in their misery. We aren't meant to live like this. We are to have absolute assurance. We are to live our lives in the fullness of his love. John 14, 1, Jesus announced his departure and said, do not be troubled, believe in God, believe in me also. But we are troubled sometimes because we think it's too easy. There has to be more, there has to be something that I can do, but he has done it all when he sent his son Jesus to save us. The only thing that we have to do is accept with our mouth that, mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. He's present with us. The scripture tells us so. We can know him. Though he is not flesh any longer, he is with us. God is real. Do we know the presence of the living God who longs to be with you? We read further in John 14, not only does he say, let not your hearts be troubled, but he also says he will send a comforter, the Holy Spirit, to be with us, to the person who keeps my commands, the one who is Christian. I will manifest myself to them. We see people in scriptures having encounters with the Lord. If you talk to other believers, they will tell you of their encounters of the presence of the Holy One. But sometimes we limit in our mind and say, not me. He doesn't want to show up to me. That's for the special ones. And we limit God in our own minds and we don't walk in the blessing that he desires for us. Why did he leave behind his Holy Spirit so that he could indwell within us? He would be with us to the ends of the earth. We wouldn't be limited by trying to follow a person around. He would be with us. And he longs to manifest his presence to you and for you to fill him in a real way. Do you know that, brothers and sisters? We have abundant teaching telling us about the security of salvation and abundant teaching of his desire to be near to his people. Psalm 27.10 tells us, though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will never forsake me. He will hold me close. For some of you, following Christ is going to mean the end of relationships because others can't go forward with you. You have lost relationship maybe already, but do you know the maker who is worth it all? Because he holds us close. He longs to be with you. And these are some of the precious promises of God. And we must walk in those. We are made for deep relationship with God. Which leads us to the second. Rejoice with unspeakable joy. God's people are to be a rejoicing people. The Bible tells us rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. Is it possible to rejoice always? It is. We, all of us, experience hard times, sorrow, and suffering. But even in that, we are to rejoice. Peter says in 1 Peter 1.8, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not even see him now, you believe and trust in him, and you greatly rejoice and delight with inexpressible and glorious joy. Peter was not writing to his fellow apostles. He wasn't writing to people who had ever seen Jesus in person. He was writing to believers that were scattered across the world right at that moment that he had never met, but he had heard about them, and he heard they were in the midst of tribulation, and he charges them, rejoice. 
with unspeakable joy. In the midst of your suffering, unspeakable joy. What is this? This is how we were meant to be as God's people. Christian people were never meant to go around miserably, dejected, like the children of Israel were. We were not meant to be unhappy. If you look at the Sermon on the Mount, that's all about how to be happy. God desires for us to live in the fullness of his blessing, his happiness, his supreme happiness. But we've all met believers who are always just hanging on. I call these the Eeyores of the faith. Have you met them? We begin to believe if we're not careful that it is our job to show the world how sour we are as believers. We begin to take things like blessed are the meek and blessed are the poor in spirit and we make them mean blessed are the sour and miserable. It is never what God meant for us. And we are limiting the Holy One of Israel. It's what we see from the Israelites. They were a miserable and dejected people. Though God had shown up miraculously and provided for them, they stuck to their misery. It's what they knew. God holds out incredible possibilities for us. Do not limit him by disregarding the life of blessing and unspeakable joy that he offers. That leads us to our third, delight in God and his commands. Delight in God and his commands. Psalm 78, we're gonna look back at verse 37. For their heart was not steadfast with him, nor were they faithful to his covenant. The Israelites were looking around at the other nations around them and they just wanted to be like those guys. We see this when they requested that they would have a king because we're kind of freaks here. The other nations have kings. We don't have a king. We want a king. The Israelites were constantly looking at what everybody else was able to do. How come these guys, they don't have to rest on the Sabbath? Nobody's telling them what to eat. They can eat anything they want. They get to marry whoever they want. Their life looks so easy. Why do we have to follow in God's ways? And they began to grumble about the life that God had called them to. Does this sound familiar to you and me? Does this sound like the Christian church today? You don't want it to be too hard. We don't want to look too different from the rest of the world because they might think we're weird. And so we begin to conform. Do we find the commandments of God to be limiting? Honestly, Christianity is very different. God's ways will always be different than the world's ways. They are opposed to one another. So when you try to make it work together, it just isn't gonna happen. But let me tell you, there is no life like the life that our God is offering us. He meant for us to enjoy keeping his commandments, to delight in it even. Psalm 119, 97 says, oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands are always with me and make me wiser than my enemies. Family, we need to stop feeling sorry for ourselves that we don't get to be a part of the things that the world gets to be a part of. That we don't get to just hang out in bars and drink the night away. We need to stop being disappointed that I can't be like my neighbor. Let me tell you, there's a reason that God gave his law. It leads to a life of abundance. And the lives that look so glamorous to us lead to destruction. They are only temporarily happy, temporarily satisfying. And that isn't what God wants for us. To my parents in the room, which of you just made up rules just to really annoy your kids? Is there anybody in here like that? I hope not. Good parents know that if they don't have rules and boundaries, their kids will not grow up to be happy, healthy, secure individuals. In fact, they've done studies on this. Parents with no boundaries have insecure children. It's the truth. It's the most unloving thing you can do. And let me tell you, our God, he's a loving father. And there's a reason for his rules and his boundaries. It is because he loves us and he wants us to live in blessing. We 
We need to delight in his commands again. They bring us wisdom even in the face of our enemies. Number four, enjoy the peace found in God. Are we enjoying the peace of God? Just ask yourself, am I enjoying God's peace right now? Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. There are many scriptures that are like this. Are we enjoying this kind of peace that passes all understanding? Listen, different things have happened in your life, have happened in my life. They've brought loss and sorrow, hardships. But do we know a peace that in all things surpasses understanding? Have you experienced this when trials come? Or have you been destroyed? Have you been beside yourself? Not knowing peace is limiting God. When the hard times came to the Israelites, they turned away from God instead of turning to him. There's no question if we do not know the peace of God, we will just be swept away in this world. When God's people turn to him, that is where they find peace in terrible tragedy. There are those of us who've experienced tragedy that have turned away from the Lord in the midst of that time. We've turned to other things in the world that seem to bring peace. And let me tell you, it doesn't work. The only thing, the only one we can turn to is the Holy One who brings us a peace that we cannot even imagine being in his presence. We must know that all things work together for good for those that love God and are called according to his name. We cannot put a limit on what God has made possible for us. Bill Johnson, just this last week, the pastor of Bethel Church in Reading, lost his wife to cancer. And I can't imagine the pain of losing your spouse, your partner. But he decided he wanted to preach to his congregation within the first three days of her being uh, lost to him. And here's something that he said in that moment. Is God my friend? He is. But he is my Lord first. And I'll never feel the pain I'm feeling right now in eternity. So this moment, it is a privilege to respond rightly to the Lord of my life with a deeper trust and devotion. I will bow before the Lamb of, on the throne in awe and worship him forever, but never will I have the face-to-face -face chance to do that while I'm in pain. So in this moment, I choose to do that. When I said yes to Jesus, I gave up my right to fully understand and to fully be in charge of my own life. Do we know a peace of God like that? That is with us in the pain and the trouble, not that we don't experience pain and trouble. I'm not advocating that we should disregard the things that are happening to us, but the peace that is brought by the Holy One, the Holy Spirit that is with us, our comforter, we need that kind of peace in this life. We must turn to him. And number five, rest in God's all-sufficiency. God is all-sufficient. He is everything that we need. Philippians 4, 12 through 13 says, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. In other words, Paul is saying, I have learned that whatever state I am, to be content. Because Jesus, he's my all in all. He's my supply. I don't have to trust on the things around me. It is him that I turn to. It is Christ who strengthens me. And it is not just Paul 
who turns to the Lord for, this, for his strength. It's not just Pastor Bill Johnson that needs to turn to the Lord for strength. It is for you and it is for me. Do we know that he is able to do more than we can ask or imagine? We cannot limit God. We cannot limit what is possible with God. We have to apply these tests to ourselves individually, but we also have to look at these tests as a church. Are we allowing God to move the way that he can move? Do we walk in his power? Do we have the Holy Spirit in our midst? Maybe for you today, the Holy Spirit is pointing something out to you that you maybe have been limiting the Holy One of Israel. I know he's speaking to me. And I'm gonna just ask that everyone close their eyes and bow their heads and consider and just bring your hearts before the Lord. And we would just be so brave as to say, God, examine me. Point out the ways that I have been failing. We wanna confess these things. We can all be guilty from time to time. And while you're considering that, I want to speak to those who have not asked the Lord into their lives. We want to go back to number one, secure in salvation. Maybe you've never asked God into your heart. You may not have known that he does all the work. He does. He loves you. Maybe you've been trying to do this on your own, and it doesn't work. You'll never live life to the full without Jesus. He came and he died for you. And if that's you in this room, in the privacy of this moment, nobody's looking around, would you raise your hand? I just want to pray for you. I won't embarrass you. And you know that God is calling to you. In the back, I see you. God is calling to you. I see you in the front. God has been calling your heart. He's been wanting to get your attention. He loves you. Are there others? Maybe you're online today and God knows your name. If you would like to take that step of salvation, would you just pray along with me in your heart? Father God, we come before you and acknowledge that we have done wrong. You have made salvation too easy and we're thankful for that. There is nothing that we can do, you did all the work, when you sent your son Jesus to die for us so that we could be in relationship with you and we can walk a life of blessing. Help us to live your way. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, we pray. Lead us and guide us, oh God. May we be different from this moment on. We love you, Jesus. Amen.